Okay, so thanks a lot for uh, listening this morning. Um, what we're going to talk about today, I think, is probably most... Uh, how many people in here raised their hand for who's the data scientist piece? A fair chunk. Okay, so what I find this sort of most helpful for is sort of two ends of the spectrum. People who are sort of classically trained statisticians and can't figure out how to think about data science or machine learning. And then on the other end, um, executives who often get to make purchasing decisions and can't figure out how to separate marketing noise from potential value in an organization. I find we often make the wrong decisions over and over again. So what this is really about is to try to help to demystify uh, some of what it is that we can do. Everyone wants to do predictive and prescriptive analytics, but like, what does that really mean? How would we use it? Why do we want it? Um, and how do we take practical next steps to make it a reality? Within Kaiser Permanente, this is not a new problem for us. <clears throat> so my favorite quote, which I usually don't list where it comes from, is quality medical care is a right cannot be achieved unless we can establish needs, separate the well from the sick, and do so without wasting physicians' time. This was said by Sidney Garfield, who was the founding physician of, uh, of Kaiser Permanente in 1970. Um, so this isn't a new problem for us. It's actually a core of if we can't, in the Scientific American article, what he goes through is if we can't figure out how to leverage computers to help us care for our members, we're not going to be able to offer them care affordably, and therefore it will be something that only the wealthy can have. And we don't want that. That's not what Kaiser Permanente is about. So this is not a brand new problem for us. What is a problem, what, what's newer for us is like, how do we do it, and how do we do it at ever-increasing scale? In 1990, David Eddy, uh, wrote a nice article in, in JAMA. Any clinical people here? Anyone work in the clinical realm? Nobody. Gosh. Okay. So JAMA, like if you can get an article in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, that's like the pinnacle of publishing um, in, in the medical world. And he basically outlines, look, you know, we've known that the amount of information and the rate at which medical knowledge is changing totally outstrips what any human being can internalize or learn. Um, and so we've got to find a better way to do it. So 20 years apart, we get a very similar message, but how do we take that and turn it into something that we can do something about to make it real? So here are some of the common problems that we face in clinical prediction. I went through a stats program myself uh, most of these we didn't talk about or we just hoped we would never have to face. So one of them, too many parameters. Um, this is the classic overload that most clinicians face every single day. There's just way too much data flying at them from way too many places. And when we talk to them, believe it or not, we say, hey, wouldn't you like to have Fitbit data? Wouldn't you love to have home sensors? And they say, please, no. Anything but that. Don't give me another data point. I can't figure out how to internalize what I have now. I don't know how to use it. I don't know what to do. It's not going to help. It's really easy to overfit data. We've seen this over and over and over again. I think these techniques are perhaps a little bit old to you guys. But we haven't dealt with this very well in the past. We are, we've done a really good job at identifying idiosyncratic patterns in our patients and then trying to apply it to the next patient and it fails miserably. We do this over and over again. Our relationships are usually not linear. So temperature, right? There's a range. If your temperature is too low, it's bad. If it's too high, it's bad. If it's in the middle, it's good. Classic nonlinear fitting problem. Um, when I went through stats class and we had to do stuff pencil and paper, we just hoped we'd never see it. Or we'd discretize the data and hope that we could make sense of it that way. Um, missingness. How many of you guys deal with missingness a lot in your data? Not as many as I might have thought. So for us, when I went through school, we assumed missingness at random. Like if we don't know somebody's age, ah, it doesn't matter, we'll just impute the average. We had something funny show up in the Kaiser, one of our data warehouses, where um, all of a sudden we had all these people who were 33 years of age, actually 32 and a half years of age. How the heck does that happen? 
Well, there was a problem with the membership load, and in particular, it impacted newborns. So we didn't know the age of newborns, and we said, that's okay. We know the average age, and all of our newborns will now be 32 and a half years old. And you can imagine where this goes to. So for us, missing this is a difficult problem. It's a real problem, but for us, it's almost always purposeful missing this. If you go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't order a lab test for you, it's not because she or he didn't think about it, it's because it's probably not meaningful. If we drew all the lab tests we could draw for people, you'd need a blood transfusion because we would have sucked all the blood out of your body. So we're very selective in what we measure and when, and it's important to consider then meaningful missingness. Um, collinearities and interactions, the most basic things that we collect about people, blood pressure. Everybody in this room has one, a blood pressure. We can't interpret blood pressure without knowing how much fluid we've given you. It's impossible. And the difference is huge. So if you have low blood pressure, if you walk into one of our emergency rooms and you have low blood pressure, and we haven't given you any fluid, there's a really good chance you're dehydrated. We give you a little bit of fluid, your blood pressure comes back up, you have no problem. If you have low blood pressure and we've given you fluid, your mortality risk goes from about a half of a percent to about 40%. That's a big deal. And that's, by the way, somewhere between one and two liters of fluid, which isn't even that much. Huge, huge impact, right? So these are the kinds of things that we have to worry about, and these are the data parts. The last bullet on this slide has to do with how we think about it and how we think about AI going forward. In clinical medicine and clinical operations, um, AI for us is almost always augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. We are not yet to the stage where we can have a computer and a robot infuse fluid into somebody or admit them directly to the hospital and lay them down in a bed or turn them over or change their glucose or most of the other things that we do, even in the ambulatory clinic, we have a human being who needs to do these things. If you want to change behavior, it's important that at least some of your key opinion leaders understand why. Not all of them, just some of them. And so we need to think about how are we going to take what it is that we discover in our data and explain it in such a way that people can pick it up. A couple of your key opinion leaders and say, yeah, you know what? We should change our practice based on what I'm seeing. And the other people in the room, they don't care about the data, but they care about this person's opinion. And so those select people, you need to be able to demonstrate why this is a reasonable thing to do. And then figure out how it fits into their work or the flow of their life. So we're going to use the Titanic data set because it turns out, I'm sure everyone has seen it, so I won't ask you to raise your hand, but it turns out that all of the things that we just talked about are present in the Titanic data set. So the first thing we'll look at is, you know, we're trying to figure out who lives and who dies. We have a bunch of parameters that we can use. And I'll show you a little video of a feature selection algorithm that we have that's going through. And on the x-axis, you have the area under the curve. And on the y-axis, you have the various parameters. And the first one that gets picked up is the sex by passenger class interaction term. And if anyone's interested in technically how we figure it out, I'm happy to go through it, but otherwise I'll skip. And then it goes on to the next step, and it says, okay, if we know the patient's sex and class, then what's the next best predictor? And it'll go through and try to figure it out. It's doing bootstrap selection here so that we're trying to figure out how we avoid that overfitting problem. And the next thing that'll matter, I think, is age. Those dummy variables, by the way, um, are put in there as noise, and they're put in there, they're just really random variables, and it highlights another problem that we often have, which is that overfitting, but it comes to us because we have thousands and thousands of possible parameters to consider. And so whenever we build a model, we run the risk that we uncover, again, something idiosyncratic about a small group of patients, or a parameter that was collected in a certain way at one clinic or one hospital and isn't collected that way in a different one. And we have to be really, really careful when we put these things out there. One, because you only get so many shots of changing someone's behavior. And two, because if you change someone's behavior in a way that kills somebody, this is generally a bad thing. 
So we'll go through, it's on the last one, and I'll tell you, you know, thankfully this dummy, none of the dummy variables make it in, but I'll, you know, you can see here that the dummy variables are actually doing better uh, than sex by itself or, or the age factor or something else. So here what we're seeing is sort of illustrating that how do we approach, how can we help explain to people which parameters um, are making it into the model, at what step, why might they be important, um, this is really, really important for those key opinion leaders who are going to have to convince a bunch of other people to change their practice. And to give you a sense of that, in, in one of our emergency rooms, we'll have about 70 physicians. Not all at the same time, but we'll have 70 physicians. So if we want physicians to start to change their behavior, that's a lot of people. If we have to go to each one of them and have this dialogue about why it is that it makes sense, we're never going to change anything. But if we can get that sort of leader person and say, hey, you know, let's sit down with you and explain why it is that this thing is important, why it matters, do you have any input, is there something we're not considering, oh, you should have taken fluid into account before considering blood pressure or something like that. We can sit down with that key opinion leader and then shift the behavior of 70, 100, 1,000, 180,000 people. Um, so that's why it matters to be able to help um, people go through how we've built the model. Okay, so here's what we get out at the end of it. And there are a couple of things to go back to the point. So the first, what we're looking at on the, on the x-axis is the probability of death, and I think you've probably all seen this before. Um, then the y-axis is the value of the particular parameter. So if you look at something, the easiest one to look at is the second down on the left, which is sex. So for the men in the room, you chose your gender poorly because you're much more likely to die than if you were female. Um, above that, though, is age. And this illustrates sort of two things pretty quickly. One is you can just see it's not a straight line. So what you want to be is either older or younger, and you don't want to be sort of middle-aged. We clinically know this is true for respiratory rate, it's true for heart rate, it's true for white blood cell count, it's true for most things that we measure. And yet again, traditionally, we would tend to just gloss over this or try to choose arbitrary boundaries of, oh, if your respiratory rate is over 20, that's bad. Well, really, is there a difference between 18 and 22? Probably not. Um, is there a difference between 22 and 40? Yes. So any of those arbitrary cuts that we make are going to have a profound impact on the clinical, our ability to reflect clinical reality in our model. And this is something that can resonate with a physician or a nurse or a respiratory therapist or a pharmacist or somebody else. So we have nonlinearity. The other thing is, what's the worst age to be? If you don't want to be on the right-hand side of the plot, the worst possible age is to have your age missing, right, N-A. So why? I mean, if we didn't even care enough to figure out what your age is, uh, why would we do that? So again, we see nonlinearity, good to be young, good to be old, bad to be in the middle. We see if your age is missing, that's really even worse than any of those. And this has direct carryover um, to clinical predictive models. If we don't bother to collect something like a white blood cell count, that probably is very, very informative. Not always, but often it's very informative if we don't bother to collect something from you. Sometimes it's not, and we can see it shift over time. We used to collect religiously whether or not a patient was confused. Anyone been in the emergency room lately? Nobody? You guys, you're not living. <laughs> so if you go in the ER, one of the things that you used to always hear is, do you know what day it is? Do you know who you are? And do you know where you are? Basic questions. We stopped documenting these. It threw off our predictive models. So we used to have something that meant something. And it meant something. Usually, if the person couldn't answer the questions at all and it was missing, it was because they were in a coma or drunk or something else and it was highly meaningful. And now missingness means something completely different. We've asked people to document too much and we've said, okay, you know what, just forget about the confusion thing. 
don't worry about that, collect these other things. So the meaning of missing this, even for basic stuff, like do you know who you are in the day of the week and where you are, the meaning of that changes over time. And we need to think about it. The last thing, though, is the sex by um, passenger class interaction term. And again, an interaction term, if, if you're not familiar with it, is that you can't understand the importance of one parameter without understanding another parameter. And this, again, is where there's deep, deep implications that resonate with people in medicine and perhaps in other areas. So if we think here about sex, usually you can't change or choose your sex. Actually, that's evolving now. Now it's quite possible to change it. But you can absolutely change your passenger class. You can pay more and go from third class to second or second to first. And so if a patient came in and said, should I do something? In this case, should I invest? Should I spend the money to go from third class to second? Or should I spend the money to go from second class to first? Which you can think of, I think there's been a fair bit around cancer. Should I do watchful waiting? Should I add on radiation? Should I add on chemo? Should I do surgery? Should I put these things together? These are decisions that we get to make all the time. And here we see a great example of a classic interaction term. So if we say, should we go from third to second class? I can't answer the question without knowing your gender. So for males, not worth it. In fact, second class does marginally worse than third class. If you're female, there's a huge lift in going from third class to second class. But what if you're already in second class? If you're male, maybe you want to go down to third. But what should we go from second to first? Should we layer chemo on top of surgery? Reasonable question, right? So to go from second to first, I can't answer the question again without knowing your sex. So for males, absolutely. You still should invest in changing your gender before you buy the first class seat. But if you're female, not that much of a lift. Maybe you want to spend your money some other way. Does that make sense? I don't think it's that hard, but hopefully you can start to see how you can take something really, really complex like cancer treatments and predictive modelings and predictive models and Bayesian models and random forests and regressions and all these different things and then boil it down into things that actually can resonate with people. Yeah, it totally makes sense to me that the relationships aren't linear. It totally makes sense to me that if we're missing a data point, it probably means something different than if we have it. And I now totally understand what an interaction term is. And if you've seen the Titanic movie, everyone can see how a machine learning algorithm was able to tell us how the movie would end. And I'll end on a story. Um, there's a lot of text here. The part that I'll summarize briefly, but the part in bold is really the important part, is the why do we do this? Why do we do this at all? Why do we bother to have predictive models? And it goes back to those statements that Sidney Garfield and David Eddy made, that on some abstract level, we know that the computer can often do things better than the human being, and maybe we'll get to the point where they can be more creative as well, even in clinical medicine. But we can routinely identify how it matters with individual patients. And this is an individual story from a physician in the ER who had a pneumonia patient come in. So a patient who had pneumonia. How many people have had pneumonia? Gosh, you guys need to get more experience. <laughs> um, I've had it three or four times myself. So I can cover, I can share with a couple of you. Um, so it's actually surprising that often we can't even tell if a patient has pneumonia. In this room right now, we're all pretty healthy, but you start to mix someone who has heart failure with someone who might have pneumonia, and it can actually be kind of hard to tell. But in this case, we knew the patient had pneumonia. And so the question wasn't, does the person have pneumonia or not? The, pa the question is, well, what should we do with this person? And the options, the immediate options were, well, we can admit this uh, person to the hospital, or we can send this person home. They're in the ER still, so it's a decision that we make 
um, probably three million times a year, that decision of should we or should we, not, within Kaiser Permanente, I mean, should we or should we not admit this patient from the emergency room. And in this particular case, uh, we actually had a predictive model that we could deploy within the electronic medical record system. So we entered the, the nurses, nursing staff entered the parameters, and out of that we had a good idea of where this patient was heading. Now Todd, Todd's the ED doc, was pretty ready to send this patient home. And the computer then came up and said, we recommend that you admit this patient to the hospital. And so he admitted the patient to the hospital. But the, there's a sort of side benefit, a greater good that we've had here that we didn't anticipate. It changed the nature of the conversation for Todd. Now, just so you know, um, Todd is the chief of emergency medicine across Kaiser Permanente over nationally. So not only, you don't get to be in that position unless two things are true. You have to be an outstanding clinician because your peers vote you into that role. And you have to be really good politically, really good at conversations, um, or you don't get the role. You can't be a jerk who's clinically sound or be someone who's super polished and not be held in high regard by people who do the same job you do every single day. So he's got both. He's a great communicator and a great clinician. He made a clinical error in judgment. And the thing that we didn't anticipate that we see over and over and over again is that it changed the way that he was able to talk with the hospitalist so that you guys know ED docs actually typically cannot admit a patient to the hospital. They have to call a consult. A hospitalist has to come down and say, do I agree with you? So the way that these conversations often go is the ED doc will say, okay, I think I should admit somebody. And then the hospitalist will come down and say, I think you're an idiot. You don't need to admit this person. And then we get into this sort of gut level, my judgment's better than your judgment kind of discussion instead of objectively looking at what are we dealing with here? Where do we think this patient's going? And how can we best serve that patient's needs? And so by being able to present this information, in a way that resonated with Todd, resonated with the hospitalist, changed Todd's behavior, it changed the whole dynamic of the conversation. And this patient received not only better care, but a better experience through that care process. So this is why at the end of the day, these models matter so much. And hopefully now you can also see why it's important for at least a couple people to understand why it is that the model is working the way that it is that doesn't mean that they should be looking at the math. They will not understand that typically. But if you can find a way to represent it to them in terms that resonate, you have a terrific opportunity to change three million times a day how it is, uh, three million times a year, how it is that we treat patients uh, just in the ED. So I will end there. Thank you, Dr. Jason Jones. Uh, we have a few minutes for Q&A, and um, I'm going to ask the first question myself. Uh, sure. Um, yesterday, we had a, a panel where um, one of uh, someone from a healthcare company mentioned that um, how they are using machine learning to now. Um, the prediction was that even doctors, like your um, other than surgeons, all the other doctors, a lot of the things they do are basically uh, subjective evaluations based on some amount of data. Um, what if machines could do it better? So machines can read your scans, your reports, probably better than humans can in yes. a few years. Um, what's the human element in medicine? And what are your thoughts on that? That is a fantastic question. And thanks for using a mic, because then we don't have to repeat it. So um, if you think about where it is that um, Kaiser Permanente and healthcare is going. I'm going to take a little bit of a sidetrack. So did any of you, when Hillary was speaking, there was that surgeon scorecard thing. Did, did any of you guys actually look at that? I, I would encourage you to if you didn't. It's, it's incredibly insightful into the state of healthcare today and how I hope we're in a completely different state in 10 years. Because what you'll see when you go on that site, has anyone had their knee replaced? You guys are like way too healthy. One person, is no one can, yes, we got one person with a knee replacement. Thank you, thank you, finally. Okay, so 
If you go on that surgeon scorecard site, what you'll see is that they are actually measuring complications. What are complications? Death, ending up on a mechanical ventilator for more than 48 hours, getting a surgical site infection, having to return to the OR uh, because something was messed up with the surgical procedure in the first place, getting pneumonia, having a cardiovascular accident like a stroke or a heart attack, ending up in the hospital for more than 30 days. Are any of these the reason why you got your knee replaced? No. I mean, I'm sorry, you don't have a mic, but I would guess it's much more likely I wanted to be able to walk, or I wanted to be able to walk pain-free, or something like that. Um, so what we measure in healthcare often is the avoidance of harm. But do any of you go in for healthcare hoping to avoid harm? I don't think so. So why does this matter? We've been focusing on what's easy to measure and not thinking about what's the product that you're trying to buy from us and how would we set up a relationship differently if the product that you wanted to buy was health, not care. It would be very different. So now where does the human side fit in? So if you're a member or just a person, a non-doc, which is probably everyone in the room, what are the things that you can bring to a partnership about your health? You can bring your goals. I want to be able to walk. I want to be able to go to my daughter's high school graduation. I want to see my grandson born. What are your preferences? What are you willing to put up with? Are you willing to have the intensive rehab required post knee surgery? How important is it to you? What are your circumstances, financial circumstances, ability to travel, ability to get to physical therapy to make this a successful process? Those are things that our members, that we all as non-clinicians know and can bring to the equation. Then there's the other, by the way, none of those do we measure today reliably, none of them. When you go to the surgical, the surgeon's scorecard, you will see harm avoidance because that is what we measure. We do not measure were you able to walk at the speed that you wanted without pain, and therefore we don't put that on the scorecard. So then what's the part that the care providing system can bring? Expertise, yes, you can look everything up in Google, you can look everything up in Wikipedia, but what neither of those will tell you is Okay, but take into account my goals, my preferences, my circumstances, and help me figure a path out of how to achieve what I'm trying to achieve given my preferences, given my circumstances. That's a human discussion. That's a human element. But that is a much more productive discussion if we can do it in the context of where does the computer think that I was going? You know. Would my walking ability be as it is now for the next 10 years? Because maybe I'm willing to put up with that. Maybe in 10 years, I think I'll be in a better financial place. I think the US healthcare system will have fixed itself. Who knows? Um, or no, you know what? It's really going downhill pretty quickly. And if you hope to walk your daughter down the aisle and that's in a year, you're unlikely to be able to do it. You should get the knee surgery now. There will be six months of recovery and you will run down the aisle with your daughter. Great. Now we can do it on the basis of data, we can do it on the basis of informed decisions because you're totally right, the computer can read the EKG better than a person can, can predict where it is that this patient with pneumonia is going better than the human can, but cannot have the discussion with the woman in the ED, how intensive do you want your treatment? If you end up on a mechanical ventilator so that we save your lungs, are you okay with that? Are you okay with the risk that we might not be able to pull you off? The computer's not gonna be able to answer that question. You can answer that question, your family members can answer that question, the computer can't. If we can figure out where the path is, as data scientists, if we can figure out that path, we can facilitate that dialogue and make people be at their best. That's the opportunity we have and that's where I hope we see ourselves going over the next five to 10 years. It's yeah. going to change what we think of as health and care in the U.S. and the world. Thank you. Anyone else? Long answer. Well. Sorry. Over here.
My biggest problem in healthcare, I didn't raise my hand either for any of those things, but uh, is finding a doctor. Yes. I moved to a new area from the Midwest to LA. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how to pick a good doctor. Are there publicly available data to help me? Mm -hmm. So there are. Um, we, if you ask me personally, I'd say none. I don't find any of them very helpful. Um, I would love to see us have a Match.com or an eHarmony type thing for healthcare. Uh, again, to get back to your question, it's if what, you, and some people don't want any relationship at all, and even that is important to know, right? There, there are some people who want a deep and personal relationship with, with their providers, nurses, physicians, and so on, and there, there are other people who don't want any relationship at all and just fix me when, I'm get sick, when I get sick. And even that is a good thing to know because there are docs and nurses who line up very nicely in each one of those buckets and every other one that we have. So no, I, I would say I've been working on that problem. I was at United Health Group for a while. I've been working on that problem uh, for about 15 years and I don't think we have a good solution to it. But I think it's because um, one of the things Hillary pointed out is often we have to wait for data, the data that we need to show up before we can provide the service. And this is a case where I'm hoping we can now start to get the data. What is it that you want? What are your preferences? What are your circumstances? And those things will include things like, do you have heart disease and you need someone with a cardiac background versus you have pulmonary disease and you need someone with a lung background versus something else, you're trying to get pregnant, who knows? But we should be able to match you to the clinical care team who can meet the needs that you actually have, not that the average person has. So apologies that we don't have a good answer. Um, I get at least a question a week. Can you, can you help me find a doc who can help me make a better decision about such and such? And if you send me one, I will try to find you the best person. But you know what? It's going to be picking up the phone and saying, hey, Dave, do you know anyone who's really good about this? <laughs> That's not a great way. That would be a great place for a computer to step in. Right. And I do apologize, I think I'm keeping you from lunch, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Can you talk about the notion of teamwork in solving healthcare problems? Oh my gosh, I couldn't have paid you more to say that one, but I'll try to keep it short. <clears throat> so we have a problem, we have a general problem with, in, in uh, care delivery of hero worship. Sri mentioned it earlier. But, and it could even be Sri out there, but I can't see because I'm blind with the lights. So the challenge that we have, if you think about how it is that people get into medicine and then how they become successful and how they get measured, they get measured as the individual hero. You don't get into medical school unless you are incredibly competitive and able to beat all of the other people who want to get in. You, don't, you get out of medical school and you don't get to get into a good residency program until you're able to do the same. And then you try to go to practice and you have to beat people. And so the entire process of your life for 30 years has been beating everybody else who you now have to turn around and try to work with. And what are the chances that that's going to be successful? without some kind of an intervention. Then on top of that, we sort of have this perspective that you're supposed to know everything. So a patient comes up, has a problem, your job is to solve the problem. Your job is not to hand off the problem to somebody else, it's to solve it. And we actually have mechanisms in place that prevent people from handling off the problem. So let me give you that, go back to that example with Todd and the hospitalist. So the ED physicians are measured on what some people refer to as moving the meat. What's the time from a patient hitting the door to a disposition? That's how the ED doc is measured. The shorter your decision time frame, the better off you are. How's the hospitalist measured? Patient day rate. Can we keep patients out of the hospital? Well, we've just set up a collision. What are the chances that Todd and Jennifer are going to have a good discussion when their goals are not just not aligned, but at odds with each other? 
If Todd wants to see another patient more quickly, the fastest thing that he can do is order a consult for ad admission. It's one button push and he's done. If he wants to discharge the patient home, especially a sick one, he's got to write a narrative about why. He's got to arrange for a home health visit. He's got to do all this extra stuff. That's impacting his ability to see the next patient and move people through the system as quickly as possible. Right? So we have these things at odds with each other. But then it goes a step further. How do we measure how good Todd is, even on the technical elements? Because nobody gets to be an ED doc unless they're proficient and they're good. And so what it means is that in order to be able to differentiate between the ED docs, we have to go to things that people do very infrequently. And I'll give you a practical example. So a pneumonia patient sometimes gets very sick and needs to have a central line inserted here so that we can measure blood pressure very close to the heart. This is a procedure that would make sense in about a quarter of a percent of ED patients. Very, very rare in the emergency department. But it's a great way to separate top clinicians from bottom clinicians, because you can look at it and it's like, my gosh, you know, Todd, you can insert a central line. You're brilliant. Never mind he's going to do it in a quarter of a percent of his patients. You know how many patients in ICU have to have that procedure? It's like 40%. We measure Todd on his ability to do things that he's almost never going to have to do so that we can separate him from his other stellar peers. Instead of turning it around and saying, well, what if we measured Todd on his ability to convince the ICU doc or the ICU nurse to come down and do it for him? We don't have those incentive systems even within Kaiser Permanente. So, we train people to be individualists and to beat and be superior to their peers. Then we measure them over and over again in their ability to do the same. And then we wonder why, when you show up, you don't get the best person to deliver what you need right then. Because we have, ins we have drilled into people that they need to be the individual hero and we can continue to incent them every single day. And we're going to, it's another of those things that we're going to have to completely change within healthcare to think about how do we incent connections? How do we incent finding the best nurse or respiratory therapist or pharmacist or physician for the needs that you have today instead of how do we find out who can do something they're never going to have to do again? Does that help? Thank you, Dr. Jason Jens, for the wonderful okay. talk and the question. Thank you. That's it. Thank you.